as we saw from Angela and Chris's talk, you know, we're doing a lot of really interesting work, doing it, uh, diving into the data, trying to derive insights so that we can use those um, insights to inform and calibrate, better calibrate our modeling approaches. Um, so we have a lot of uh, work that's still ongoing, but uh, I just wanted to give an example of what we can kind of do already with the tools we already have at hand. So this is just an example of kind of putting it all together. So looking at all the different pieces of the problem, we have weather forecasting. So for this example um, that I'm going to show of microsighting, we're using the, the Winsel Kit LED that uh, Caroline and John talked about. So this is, again, a publicly accessible data product. Um, we're considering facility scale flow. Um, so what happens in the atmospheric boundary layer in which the turbines operate and in which the eagles are flying. So we're using the large eddy simulator that uh, Regis um, described. So this is a turbulence resolving uh, CFD simulation of the flow at facility scale. Um, and the tool we're using was developed at NREL. It's called SOFA, which is a simulator for wind farm applications. And then to account for where we think the eagles might be, uh, we're considering migratory pathways that are predicted by this, uh, the SSRS model that Rimble described. And then to tie it all together, I've brought in um, a multi-objective wind plant optimization software um, called Floris that was also developed at NREL and is, is open source. So this is kind of a recipe for how we're, we're um, approaching this microsighting exercise, but um, feel free to plug in um, whatever in-house or proprietary tool you have into this workflow, whatever works for you. Um, I think this is just intended to be an example of uh, how things might fit together. Uh, so I mentioned that Floris, or on the previous slide, I wrote that Floris is a wake uh, modeling um, software. So really wind plant performance and wake modeling go hand in hand. You can't predict how well a wind farm is going to perform and how much energy it's going to produce without modeling the wakes. Um, by virtue of turbines um, generating power, you're going to be re removing kinetic energy from the wind. So um, turbines at the front of a wind plant will see will extract more power and then behind them they'll leave a low speed turbulent wake. So turbines within the wind farm um, deeper within the wind farm will produce less power. So that's why we need um, some sort of wake model to understand what's happening when we're within a wind plant um, to better understand how we should design a wind plant. So on the right, we have some example um, uh, wind plant layouts and corresponding flow fields predicted by this florist tool. This is a view of the um, kind of candidate wind plant designs as seen from above. The black bars are wind turbines oriented in different directions. Um, the warmer colors are uh, higher wind speeds, the cooler colors are lower wind speeds. So red is free stream, blue is the low speed uh, turbulent wake that I talked about. Um, to facilitate the optimization, or really to enable the optimization problem, we have to use a steady state wake model. Um, that can run very efficiently on your laptop. So one of these calculations takes less than a second on, on a laptop. The inputs are a turbine layout, a rotor geometry, so a rotor diameter and a hub height, and then a performance curve. So some understanding of how the performance and thrust of these turbines uh, change depending on the wind speed seen by the turbine. Uh, we're using for this demonstration a new capability within Floris that allows us to specify heterogeneous inflow to a wind plant, and that is a way for us to account for the effects of terrain. So this is a pretty challenging problem because we're operating in a discrete multimodal design space. So discrete in the sense that we're doing an opt optimization problem for um, discrete numbers. So the you can't have fractional numbers of turbines in your wind plant. You either have 50 or you have 51. You can't have 50 and a half turbines. Um, the design space is multimodal, so it's, it's um, the uh, performance of a wind plant is not necessarily unique. You can have very, very different looking layouts um, that produce this, about the same amount of power. Um, we're using a gradient-based optimization approach. Um, so uh, um, one of the major caveats of this approach is that you're not guaranteed to find a global optimum the design will converge to um, a particular optimal design 
um, starting from some initial conditions. So their sensitivity to initial conditions as well. Um, and then lastly, as pointed out in this recent paper by Stanley et al. in 2021, the optimum wind plant layout really depends on your objective function. So if you optimize for annual energy production, you get one layout with a certain number of turbines. If you optimize for cost of energy, that um, layout and number of turbines changes very uh, changes drastically. And you could also optimize for profit as well, which is a function of energy production as well as cost. So for our study, we've looked again at top of the world, we've looked at a six by six kilometer region. Um, we've used SOFA to simulate this turbulent flow field as shown in the lower right. Again, this is the flow over terrain um, uh, over a period of several hours. Um, and you can, the turbulent structures in the flow are pretty apparent. So on the top, we've looked at the conditions at the site um, split up by season. And just for this demonstration, I've picked a single wind condition. So a uh, westerly flow at eight meters per second. So given a time average flow field from SOFA on the shown on the bottom left with the wind flowing from left to right, we can run Floris um, and uh, with, a, with an optimizer wrapped around it, a gradient based optimizer. And in this case, we're just considering annual energy production. And we can see that this layout for this region um, produces 29.6 uh, megawatts. So this is kind of a baseline result. Again, it's not guaranteed to be the optimal design. We're not trying to recreate top of the world. This is just purely for um, demonstration purposes. So then we can apply the tools that we have and take this one step further. So if we run um, the SSRS model for the same conditions and zoom in on the region of interest, we can derive now exclusion zones. So you can see the crosshats region on the right figure. And now our power production has dropped a little bit from 29.6 to 29.0 megawatts. So I think in summary, this is uh, this shows that the cost of building Eagle safe wind plants, we could start to um, build up our tools that can estimate this. Um, and so for just a single wind condition for a single site, we came up with this order of magnitude estimate of um, the cost of building this, um, or in counting, uh, uh, sorry, accounting for um, eagle presence. So in this case, it was reduced by about 2%. Um, the caveat, of course, is that we're looking at just a single condition and we can optimize for different conditions, different times of year. And of course, we'd have to consider the full wind rows if this were truly a complete sighting exercise. Um, there is a large design space, as I mentioned, and in introducing exclusion zones based on eagle presence definitely increases the complexity. Um, the, let's see, uh, something to note is that, um, you know, you can look at this as being glass half full or glass half empty. So the glass half empty is, okay, we're gonna take a 2% um, hit in AP, but the, really the glass half full approach is saying that, okay, there, there is such a large design space that chances are good that even if we do account for eagle exclusion zones, we could still come up with a design that is comparable to without the exclusion zones because there's such a large design space. Um, the optim optimality depends on our design objective. So currently, the depending on whether you're an owner operator um, or utility, you're interested probably in the cost of energy or profit or energy production, but this is, this can maybe help uh, help adjust our thinking about the problem. So the optimization problem could also include beyond these traditional measures and I'll start to think, um, to help us think about and start accounting for things like environmental impact. So we can start factoring in things like um, say the cost of environmental permitting. So this could all feed into our optimization potentially. And as I noted earlier, I think this is sort of just a, a framework that um, that could definitely be tailored to your organizational needs. Um, so hopefully that was interesting and um, useful for you all. And that's all I have to share at the moment. Uh, thanks for your attention.